With the decline of the levee before World War I, two prominent nightlife entertainment districts emerged in the 1920s, each catering to a different clientele and under the influence of distinct political forces. One of these districts thrived on the near north side, centered around Rush Street. This area was dominated by white ward leaders and financially supported by white bootleggers. While black entertainers occasionally found employment there, black customers were generally unwelcome in the establishments of the near north side. The second entertainment district was known as The Stroll, a renowned black entertainment hub stretching along South State Street from 31st to 39th Streets. The vibrant establishments of The Stroll included cafes, dance halls, black and tan cabarets, and gambling houses. It served as a nurturing ground for black artists, attracted a diverse clientele of both white and black patrons, and received protection from emerging black political leaders in the second and third wards. Given the significance of policy gambling and the nightlife entertainment scene in the social fabric and economy of the black ghetto, successful black politicians found themselves involved in mediating between these institutions and the criminal justice system. In the 1920s, two prominent politicians in the black community exemplified contrasting approaches to this role. Oscar de Priest, a prosperous businessman, pursued an ambitious political career, with his involvement in gambling protection being secondary to his overall political trajectory, eventually becoming a symbol of black achievement. On the other hand, Dan Jackson, a prominent black gambler with extensive investments in cabarets and a strong interest in entertainment development, primarily used his political career to advance his activities as an operator, promoter, and coordinator of ghetto entertainment. Jackson's involvement in gambling and political corruption attracted media attention, while De Priest's career suffered most from criminal charges, despite his focus on political achievements. De Priest, originally from Alabama, arrived in Chicago in 1889 and gradually climbed the social ladder from a house painter to a successful realtor. He joined forces with other black individuals to gain control of the Republican organization in the second ward, eventually becoming the first black elected to the city council in 1915. However, in 1917, he faced indictment alongside police officials and gamblers, accused of conspiracy to protect gambling. As a ward leader, De Priest acted as a mediator between local police and prominent Southside gamblers, including figures like Henry Teenan Jones, who succeeded Mushmouth Johnson. De Priest's defense team, led by Clarence Darrow and Edward Morris, successfully argued that the funds collected were campaign contributions rather than bribes, securing his acquittal. Despite the indictment, De Priest maintained an active role in local Republican politics, even after withdrawing from the race for a second city council term while under indictment. With the redrawing of ward boundaries in 1921, he shifted his focus to the third ward and continued to mediate between gambling entrepreneurs, the local police, and courts. In 1928, De Priest made history as the first black congressman elected from the North. His campaign for Congress faced renewed indictments related to gambling, but the charges were eventually dropped, allowing him to assume his seat and become a symbol of emerging black political aspirations. While De Priest did not personally cultivate a reputation as a gambler, his career highlighted the close connection between building a black political base and coordinating participation in gambling. Dan Jackson, in contrast to De Priest, followed a different trajectory. Born in Pittsburgh in 1870 and educated at Lincoln University near Philadelphia, he came to Chicago with his family in the early 1890s. While his family excelled in the undertaking business, Jackson's marriage to Robert Motz's sister steered his energies toward gambling and entertainment. He emerged as a major black gambler and utilized his political career to encourage and regulate the entertainment activities on the South Side. During the 1920s, Dan Jackson played a central role in the Second Ward Syndicate, which had connections to Mayor Thompson and the Republican organization. He engaged in collecting payoffs from gamblers and cabaret owners in the ward, while also orchestrating police raids on establishments 
that did not comply with his demands. Additionally, Jackson was involved in several cabarets and gambling houses between 27th and 36th streets, operating some of the largest policy wheels, a form of illegal lottery, on the south side. One of his notable ventures was the ownership of the renowned Pekin Theater, which remained a prominent center for black entertainment. Another significant establishment under Jackson's influence was the Racetrack, a large gambling house located at 3103 South State Street. It served as the headquarters for his Springfield and Interstate Policy Wheels. Assisting him in running the policy wheel were individuals such as Julian Black and Policy Sam Young. The Dreamland Cafe in the 3,500 block of South State Street, managed by William Bottoms, was the most famous black and tan cabaret in the city, known for its integration of black and white patrons. Jackson likely had a financial interest in the cafe and operated a gambling house above it. During the Prohibition era of the 1920s, Chicago's South Side emerged as a significant center for the development of jazz styles and other forms of popular black entertainment in the United States. The bustling entertainment district along the stroll featured elegant cabarets, ballrooms, theaters, and numerous speakeasies. Musicians showcased the best jazz of the decade, while comedians and dancers entertained the crowds with exciting floor shows. Prominent figures such as Joe King Oliver, Louis Armstrong, Earl Fatha Hines, Cab Calloway, and Alberta Hunter either started their careers in Chicago or achieved fame there during the 1920s. Notably, unlike Harlem during the same period, even the finest establishments on the South Side welcomed black customers, with some venues known for the mixing of black and white patrons despite the prevailing norms of segregation. This greater integration of entertainment in Chicago may have been influenced by the need for cabarets and ballrooms on the South Side to navigate their relationships with city government through black politicians. Despite the remarkable success of black entertainment on the South Side, the position of blacks within Chicago's entertainment renaissance was complex. Most of the city's nightlife was concentrated outside the black belt. The near North Side Entertainment District, hotel ballrooms in the Loop and other areas, and suburban roadhouses thrived. But black customers were often excluded, and black entertainers faced barriers to employment in these venues. Consequently, white entertainers had greater opportunities compared to their black counterparts. Notable white musicians who emerged from Chicago in the 1920s included Bix Beiderbeck, Mez Mesro, Eddie Condon, Gene Krupa, Benny Goodman, and the Austin High Group. These white musicians recognized their indebtedness to the art and culture of black musicians. After closing time in the Loop or near North Side, they would flock to the South Side establishments to learn from and be inspired by the black musicians they admired. While black entertainment reflected important aspects of urban black culture in the 1920s, it developed within the context of illegal activities. Many of the cafes, cabarets, and roadhouses operated in violation of prohibition laws by serving alcoholic beverages. Some establishments, particularly those on the north side and in the suburbs, were owned by whites associated with the city's bootlegging gangs. The involvement of bootleggers occasionally led to violence and unscrupulous business practices that affected both black and white entertainers working for them. Moreover, the use of marijuana and cocaine was part of the jazz culture for some individuals during the 1920s. The cabarets and jazz clubs on the South Side also offered rooms for various games of chance, such as craps and poker. Additionally, in many jazz venues, women would solicit customers to buy drinks and engage in the provision of sexual services for a fee. The area surrounding the stroll was known for its street walkers and prostitution flats, forming one of the city's most extensive red light districts. Understanding the culture of black entertainment and its reception in wider society necessitates recognizing its interconnectedness with the marginal and underworld aspects of city life during that time. In 1923, the Second Ward Syndicate, led by Dan Jackson, faced challenges when Mayor Thompson withdrew from the Republican primary due to multiple scandals in his administration. 
Instead of supporting Thompson's opponent on the Republican ticket, both Oscar DePriest and Jackson endorsed William Dever, the Democratic candidate. Although Thompson remained publicly neutral, it is likely that he privately favored Dever. This marked the first time in Chicago's history that black voters supported a Democrat with 53% overall and 69% in the second ward. Jackson rallied the gambling fraternity to support Dever, assuring them that their protection arrangements would remain intact. However, Dever's ties to reformers and his belief that the mayor should enforce the laws, including prohibition laws that he opposed, led to a bitter disappointment for those expecting leniency. With support from influential black ministers, Daver took a personal initiative in demanding raids on drinking and gambling establishments in the Black Belt, even temporarily revoking the license of the Dreamland Cafe. As a result, the years from 1923 to 1927 were challenging for the entertainment industry on the South Side. The troubled times forced gamblers to make significant changes. In May 1923, many gamblers chose to forego their annual visit to the Kentucky Derby. Southside pawnbrokers benefited from buying the gamblers' diamond rings and tie pins. Rumors circulated that Jackson was considering leaving Chicago for greener pastures in New York City. The Springfield and Interstate Policy Wheel, including most policy syndicates, continued operating but with heightened secrecy. Some gambling houses remained open, employing lookouts on the streets and installing steel doors to delay police raids. Various meetings took place between gamblers, politicians, and the police in unsuccessful attempts to establish new protection arrangements. However, in 1927, Big Bill Thompson, campaigning on a promise of an open town policy, returned to City Hall for a final term as mayor. Despite facing opposition from reformers, Thompson mobilized Chicagoans dissatisfied with Daver's enforcement of prohibition laws. He garnered support from the Al Capone, Jack Guzik bootlegging group, and as usual, rallied black voters to his cause. When the Daily News revealed that gambling operated without police interference in the black belt, police commissioner William F. Russell candidly stated that he had not received any orders to interfere in the policy racket, and until he did, he would refrain from taking action. Thompson had won the black belt by a margin of 100,000 votes, suggesting that its residents supported his open town platform. Jackson, as the leader of Thompson's faction in the second ward, became the Republican ward committeeman. It is said that he allowed DePriest to run for Congress because his own interests in gambling and entertainment prevented him from going to Washington. However, he did accept an appointment to the Illinois State Commerce Commission, likely the highest state office held by any black politician in the United States. Nevertheless, Jackson stipulated that someone else would represent him at meetings in Springfield. Until his untimely death in 1929, Jackson's life revolved around the entertainment and gambling industry of the South Side. During the revival of gambling in Chicago, the policy gamblers, led by Charlie Jackson, Dan Jackson's brother, organized a special train called the Policy Special in March 1928. This train was added to the regular train route to provide a 10-day outing to Hot Springs, Arkansas for the gamblers. The purpose of the policy special was to allow the gamblers to avoid the segregated Jim Crow facilities that black individuals were subjected to in southern states at that time. With the resurgence of gambling, Dan Jackson's nephew took charge of running the north-south and east-west policy wheels openly. Additionally, the Tijuana Wheel, the city's largest policy syndicate, operated from a building owned by Jackson at 2961 South State Street policy runners, would gather at the headquarters twice a day to bring in betting slips, while crowds of bettors attended the colorful drawings. Police officers were present both inside and outside the building to direct traffic and safeguard the cash boxes. The interstate, no longer under Jackson's control, was managed by Julius Benvenuti, an Italian, in collaboration with the veteran Policy Sam Young. During the 1920s, 
strong black Republican organizations emerged in the second and third wards of Chicago. Through these organizations, black communities maintained close ties with Mayor Thompson and Republican state officials, which helped foster the growth of the gambling and entertainment industries in the black belt. Oscar DePriest and Dan Jackson represented two different approaches through which black politics and black entertainment became intertwined. In 1931, it would have been challenging to foresee that no Republican would ever again hold the position of mayor of Chicago.